All right. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I am Nick from Morantis, and I want to welcome you to today's webinar, Demystifying Cloud Security Compliance. This is a topic that is certainly not light, uh, but fortunately, we have some experts with us today to help us out. Uh, Brian Langston and Jason James. I'm going to ask them to give us a quick uh, one sentence introduction. Brian, uh, tell us about yourself. Hi, I'm Brian Langston. I'm the Director of Architecture within Marantis's Professional Services Group. Uh, my team uh, works with customers across various industries uh, designing uh, cloud solutions on prem. All right, awesome. Thank you. And uh, Jason? Hey everyone, I'm Jason James. I'm Director of Security for the Professional Services Group. I work closely with uh, Product and Brian Langston's team. All right, awesome. Let us uh, quickly just kind of go over. Brian, you want to give us a quick overview of what we're going to talk about? Sure. Yeah, there's uh, several things we want to cover uh, focused around this idea of demystifying cloud compliance. Um, we will talk about uh, the kind of a general framework of an approach that's uh, worked for us and works for many of our customers. Uh, we'll talk about uh, some approaches to tool selection, and then we'll use four examples uh, with file integrity management, uh, sorry, monitoring, security baseline, elevated privilege management, and, and event auditing to kind of approve and illustrate uh, the uh, points that we'll make from the first two bullets. Okay. And this is a this is a vendor neutral thing that we're talking about. It's not like, oh, this is you know what Mirantis does for you. This is correct. A, correct. <laughs> yep. Okay. Yep. No one yep. yeah. think we're you know here to sell you because we're not. Yeah, oh. yeah, based on real life uh, pain points from uh, many of our customers and um, kind of lessons learned and observed. And um, so, yeah, there should be something that uh, everybody can get, uh, you know, new out of this. Okay, so um, before we get started, we just kind of want to get sort of a level set on where everybody is. So I'm just going to, we want to do a quick poll here. Um, so uh, the question is, what are your plans for deploying on-premise cloud? So if you can go ahead and just kind of give us a sense of where you are, um, that will give us a feel for where we need to go. So we'll just give it about 30 more seconds. See the responses are starting to come in. Um, in general, it <clears throat> looks like you guys have already implemented on-premise infrastructure uh, or are in the process of implementing. Uh, give it a few more seconds. And okay. All right. So, uh, yeah, so basically looks like uh, 40, 50. So half of you are either implementing uh, or are already in production. Uh, and uh, very small percentage, only 17% of you are, have no plans right now. So just about everybody's in this boat, which is what we need to know. All right. So moving along. Um, Brian, I'm going to ask you to just kind of take us through this. So okay. Take it away. <laughs> All right. Thanks. If, uh, yeah, let's go to our first slide here, navigating a cloud security program. Um, so kind of picking up from where the poll data is telling us, um, one thing that we've seen within Rantis over the past several years is uh, on-prem solutions uh, typically follow in a kind of a pattern of kicking tires and seeing if various solutions are uh, are right for you. Um, there's there's this there's this initiative of uh, after you've after you've demonstrated that uh, that a certain solution, whether it's a platform like OpenStack or Kubernetes, uh, you move into some POC mode. 
you validate that you're on the right track uh, with your strategy, things are working out, and as some of you have indicated, you now have production workloads on your on-prem cloud. It's at that point where security starts to become, if it wasn't already, uh, a kind of leading or guiding principle, it becomes one. Uh, you now have other stakeholders that have a vested interest in what you're doing on that cloud. And uh, again, if you weren't already uh, guided towards a specific uh, security framework, um, you might be asked to, you might be given a specific uh, framework uh, to align with. Um, some of that guidance is provided, some of it's not. And anyway, so, so people find themselves in different phases of this, of this deployment uh, process and eventually come up with a challenge of what do, what do I do? What, how, do I, how do I think about security? Um, and and how, do I, how do I demonstrate compliance? So um, what we wanted to do with this uh, first um, set of messages is outline five, uh, five points that can help frame um, your thinking about a cloud security program so that your, uh, your performance within the program is more effective and uh, more, more you know, uh, time-wise. So the first point we wanna make is aligning with a framework. Um, you've all heard of various uh, frameworks. Um, you know, GDPR has been in the news a lot, PCI for financial services. FedRAMP for government um, government programs. There's a bunch of them. Um, HIPAA. It, it, there's there's many. So um, one one thing obviously to do is figure out what what framework that you need to align with. And um, once you do that, uh, one thing that is very helpful to understand is the objective of an auditor. At some point, whether it's an internal audit or an external audit, uh, someone's going to ask to review what your security program is and what uh, procedures and tools uh, that you've implemented. Understanding how that auditor comes in can help minimize a lot of wasted effort, panicking about things that don't matter a whole lot. Um, if you think about uh, what this picture conveys here, um, there's construction going on, there's an auditor. An auditor has a checklist, and an auditor looks for uh, evidence of compliance. They really don't care if you framed a wall with a certain brand or type of saw. They really don't care whether you hit the nail four times or five times or with the pneumatic, right? They just don't care. They just look for evidence of compliance. So given that they don't come in with a prescribed set of tools to look for, um, you don't need to bother so much as to which tool, uh, because honestly, you might be in the situation where an auditor comes to you and they say, all right, uh, tell me how you're satisfying uh, control X. And you mentioned it's through the use of tool Y. They may or may not have even heard of that tool. And if they haven't heard of it, that's totally okay, because all they're interested in is are you, can you show me evidence of your, uh, your performance, your execution, your use of that tool uh, in the satisfying of this control? So, so that's, that can really help eliminate a lot of excess uh, uh, research. Um, it can help eliminate some worry uh, just by understanding how, the, uh, how an audit is going to work. Um, once you understand that, then you can shift to understanding what the burden of proof is for each control. And this can still be a little bit difficult. Um, depending on where you are in your um, awareness uh, and expertise of security, uh, many people we talk to that are very smart technically look at, um, look at the language within security frameworks and really struggle to interpret what is that really asking me? What is that requiring me to do? Is it some really huge initiative that requires a lot of time and effort, or is it much simpler? Um, so understanding the language to, to understand what the burden of proof is for each control is extremely helpful. Um, and there are some key words that are commonly found throughout uh, security frameworks that can help that process. Uh, we'll get into some of those a little later. Um, 
related to that idea is point number four, distinguishing policy from process from technology. Um, a policy is basically an assertion of what you will be delivering, what you will be accomplishing, um, what you will be controlling. And that's different from a process or a procedure, which is intended to give you a chance to outline specifically the how you execute or carry out your policy. And some of the language will point to uh, a technology. And there are certain keywords that can help uh, identify when a technology is being referred to or suggested versus just a policy or procedure. So those, th those three things, knowing how to filter a, a, a control, um, a control specification, the language uh, can really help you narrow down to what the deliverable is. And then finally, once you have kind of your controls uh, kind of filtered into these three buckets, it's much easier to uh, complete uh, a RACI model, a uh, model that uh, represents uh, who is responsible, who is accountable, who is consulted, who is informed. Um, the responsibility for delivering a policy might be different from the person responsible for delivering the procedure. Uh, and that might be different from the person or group that is responsible, responsible for the selection of a tool, the architecture of it, the implementation of it, the support of it. There's a lot of different roles and responsibilities and having a well-defined RACI model is invaluable. Um, when there's a security incident uh, that happens that needs triaging, needs forensic analysis, uh, the time is past where you uh, figure out uh, who do I talk to, where do I go, um, you know, who owns this. So those five things really form a kind of a framework for thinking about uh, cloud compliance and um, and, and again, kind of following those five is, is helpful to demystifying uh, cloud compliance. So Nick, if we can go to the next slide, uh, we can talk a little bit about tools. Um, a common question um, that we get as we consult with customers around the world in different uh, industries is, what's the right tool? Um, we, we consult with uh, open source tools, we integrate with third party tools, we do integration with homegrown tools. Um, so a lot of customers uh, talk to us and they say, well, which one should I use? Is there a better one? Which is the right one? Um, so the answer to all those is really yes. Um, <laughs> is, is, is open source the right one? Uh, yes. Is the third party the right one? Yes, so is homegrown. Um, the key thing to remember is that the security framework that you're aligning with doesn't prescribe a tool. You will not find it in that language. It just defines a rule or a requirement at a really high level. And how that tool, how, sorry, how that rule uh, gets implemented and eventually proven in an audit, I mean, that's, that's all up to you. So if there, was, if there was supposed to be a more specific criteria in how you select tools, there would be more specific language in the control specs, which there aren't. So the right answer is whichever one works for you. Uh, whatever you have skills for, whatever you have budget for, whatever you understand the best, maybe what you've used in the past, those are all valid uh, means of justifying what the tool is. Um, the key, again, coming back to this audit scenario is, if you can show that you use that tool that you have selected consistently, to satisfy the control spec, you've got you know the peace of mind that you need going into an audit, and that's that's what you need. You're good to go. So, um, so the next uh, four slides is really what we wanted to use to walk through um, some of these principles that I've just outlined. Um, one thing that we have found, um, I mentioned that there's a number of security frameworks that. Uh, are candidates for uh, implementation uh, in your environments. Um, there's a lot of common language, and if it's not common language, the principles, the concepts that the language represents are similar. Um, 
for those that may not have heard of the Cloud Security Alliance, uh, this is uh, a group that um, has created a cloud controls matrix. Um, the cloud controls matrix is a group of security categories and control IDs that have a control spec. And the nice thing about the, I'll just refer to it going forward here as the CCM. The nice thing about the CCM is that it's more human readable. It's much more consumable, digestible, understandable um, than just going into say a NIST control or PCI control and going, what is this really saying? Um, the CCM, because of it being security related, I mean, it's a, it's a cloud, like I said, the CSA Cloud Security Alliance, it's cloud focused. So and when we're talking about addressing cloud security, this is uh, a little bit more you know, specific to, to a cloud use case, uh, which should help um, you know, that part too. So um, you'll find that CCM controls map very well to your NISTs and PCIs and GDPRs and every control, every framework uh, that you might need to be concerned with for your own environment. And because there is that clean mapping, if you can satisfy um, your solution, your procedures, policies to a CCM matrix, you'll find that you're uh, also satisfying the underlying NIST controls to which the CCM controls map. And that's a pretty neat, handy uh, relationship. So the first one I wanna cover here is file integrity monitoring. Uh, you won't find file integrity monitoring language in any of the security frameworks, but it's a concept that's implied due to some of the language. Um, what is file integrity monitoring? It's, you know, this is my definition. It's the, it's the activity associated with monitoring changes in an operating system or application software from a known baseline. So if you look at the CCM control spec for AIS, AIS is uh, application and uh, interface security. And this is the fourth ID within that uh, control category. This control says, this, the text that you have, and I won't read it, but I do want to pull out um, certain keywords that should uh, trigger your thinking as to how you would come up with file integrity monitoring based on looking at this spec. If you look at the word confidentiality, this suggests limiting access, right? It's locking um, a file. A, a file or directory down, it's permissions. Uh, the next word is integrity. Integrity is about maintaining consistency in IT, staying true to form. Uh, if you look at availability, uh, can you make it available, uh, whatever resource, if it were to go away? Uh, to make something available, you obviously have to know what's missing. Um, and then prevent, uh, this implies some kind of enforcement, uh, enforcement mechanism or tool. Uh, so this would be a, a trigger that uh, this is not going to be just a process, but involve in some way uh, a tool. Uh, improper disclosure, um, that would again refer to the idea of permissions. Uh, alteration, uh, that's, it's an easy one, it's change, right? Did something change? What changed? When? By whom? Uh, and then destruction. Is something deleted? Was something deleted? Is a service degraded? Uh, has it been discontinued? Right, so these are all kind of the, the, the conditions, the, the parameters within which you would um, say, all right, how do I, you know, what is this all pointing me towards? Um, and you'll notice at the very beginning of this uh, control spec, uh, policies and procedures. So again, that's where you have to declare uh, what policy you are uh, enforcing and, and writing a policy could literally be something as simple as rewarding the policy that you see here on the screen. You might say, my company shall establish and maintain and blah, 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 and finish off the rest. And that's your policy, right? Your procedure would be the steps that you take to implement that policy. And you might point in your uh, procedure the use of a certain tool. Um, and some of these tools are what you see on the screen here. Um, and there, there's a lot. There's really many, many tools that satisfy uh, this idea of file integrity monitoring. Um, Audit D uh, and rules uh, are, are one way to use native Linux tools. Um, you can 
build some custom rules that uh, uh, monitor the right resources uh, to satisfy this requirement. Wazoo, for those that may not be familiar, uh, is a really neat open source uh, security platform uh, that has a lot of uh, neat integrations and features. The file integrity monitoring is one of them. Um, some, a lot of our customers use Cloud Passage, another great tool, uh, very comprehensive, robust, that's got uh, a lot of features in it. But it doesn't have to be a very complex, robust tool. They can literally be something as simple as using Audit D and rules. And that's why I put this spectrum in here. Um, you know, how complex you get is all up to you, right? As long as you can defend your selection of that tool and show that you use it consistently, that's really all that matters. You might discover later on that you need to be a little more robust um, in, in how you're doing uh, file integrity monitoring, but there's nothing wrong with uh, using something as simple, simple as Audit D and, and some rules. So I listed some rules here just to kind of seed some thinking for those that may not be familiar with, uh, with the, the concept of file integrity monitoring. Again, there are many, many, many things to, to monitor. Um, obviously, some critical system files, system directories, uh, configs for sudo, for SSH, um, lots of things. And uh, anyway, so that's file integrity monitoring. Um, so the next slide, please. So security baselines is another uh, critical one. Um, there are probably over 30, I think, uh, NIST uh, controls, if you're familiar with NIST, that all mention um, configuration in, in some form. Um, security baseline, the concept of it is very common. Um, my definition, again, of, of a security baseline is simply, you know, it's a, it de it's a defined configuration state. Um, so having a well-defined uh, configuration management policy and the corresponding procedures and and tools satisfies a lot of other controls. If you can, you know, define your configuration management uh, implementation, uh, it's easy enough to just point to it as you uh, get to uh, a control spec like the one here that I'm referring to in CCM that covers uh, governance and risk management, or GRM1. In this one, and again, I'm just going to highlight some of the key words. Um, baseline security requirements shall be established. So basically, you, you've got to have some rules that govern how you establish and maintain a security baseline. And there's lots of ways to do this, as there are with, with most things in security. Uh, we'll talk about a few of these in a second. But the key point here, um, or se second key point to pull out of this control is uh, deviations uh, from the baseline must follow change management. And that's pretty straightforward. Uh, third key point is to reassess compliance at least annually. Um, you'll find some language in control in security frameworks rather that uh, sometimes specify a frequency, sometimes they don't, sometimes they just uh, say regularly. Um, I would highly recommend uh, a, a baseline security review a lot more than just annually um, for a lot of reasons. Um, so, like I mentioned, there's a lot of ways to establish a security baseline. Um, again, kind of the, the simplest form might be in the way of um, uh, writing some custom scripts, creating some automation. Uh, if your infrastructure is defined in code that's sitting in, say, a Git repo, um, you might say, all right, I can intelligently parse that code and extract the settings that go into my cloud deployment. Um, and that's true. Nothing wrong with that. You could set up a process that tracks and manages changes against that baseline, uh, and that would be sufficient. Um, CIS benchmarks uh, is another way. Uh, for those that aren't aware of what CIS is, uh, CIS stands for the Center for Internet Security. Uh, this is a group that maintains literally dozens, I think over 140 or so benchmarks. Um, I've found that they don't, the, the CIS doesn't have a benchmark for everything that uh, goes into a cloud deployment, but they do cover quite a bit. And there's some really you know, big hitters that are covered in CIS. For example, if you take the Linux benchmark from CIS, um, there's, uh, I can't remember what the count is up to, but uh, a couple hundred uh, checks in there. 
but these benchmarks are basically best practices defined by uh, a global community of industry experts. These people might be Ceph experts, they might be uh, Kubernetes, containers experts, sometimes they're companies. Um, there's all different uh, ways of contributing uh, these benchmarks. Um, so if you take a Linux benchmark uh, from CIS, for example, and you assess your environment against that benchmark, that can become your baseline, right? Of 200, uh, you know, benchmarks or checks in the Linux CIS benchmark, how do I stack up? Am I 50% you know, compliant or aligned? Um, whatever you are, you might make a statement along the lines you know, for your environment of we're 65% compliant with the Linux benchmark. And from there, you could make incremental changes over time to your platform configuration following your, your already documented change management process. So that would be one implementation, one way of, of demonstrating that uh, you are creating that baseline and, and then doing something with it, taking action on it. Um, another way to use CIS benchmarks is through the use of some open source tools like OpenSCAP and the XML-based document formats um, referred to as OVAL and XCCDF. These are both XML-based formats that help you uh, define what that target state is that you desire. And those documents can be run within the, the engine uh, that uh, you get with OpenSCAP, and that can create a very effective way of automating um, your, your baseline uh, analysis. So um, a best practice that uh, we have seen very effective is just to make a goal of continuous improvement, uh, find some uh, find some uh, regularity in how you run, uh, how frequently you run these benchmarks. Uh, as long as you've got a team that can take action on the outputs, um, that's key. So uh, several tools for doing security baselines. Um, next slide, please, Nick. Uh, so the next one we want to cover is elevated privilege management. And again, uh, you won't see those three words verbatim in security frameworks. Uh, you will see concepts referred uh, to this idea. Um, again, my definition of it is authentication and tracking use of root permissions, basically. I mean, there's a little more to that, but uh, at a high level, that's kind of what's, what's implied here. Um, there's a CCM control spec for uh, IVS, it's a mouthful, it's a, it's a big control category, but I'll just call it IVS1 for short. Um, and again, extracting keywords, um, you need a log management solution. That's pretty clear. Uh, unique use, uh, sorry, uh, unique user access accountability. Um, you gotta have some way of knowing who's doing what. Um, you'll notice that file integrity is mentioned. So this is, just an example of how uh, the FIM solution that I described earlier can be a complement to this concept of elevated privilege management. So you can point to that solution and say, you know, we're doing file integrity using FIM. Done. Check. Uh, you move on. Um, support forensic investigative capabilities. That's a pretty serious uh, requirement. Um, and clearly, this is an area where tool selection. Uh, is needed, and that'll give you varying levels of effectiveness in supporting forensic analysis. Obviously, not all tools are created equally. Uh, some are going to struggle supporting decent forensic analysis, and others are going to uh, do a really good job of it. Um, some companies that we've seen have gotten really creative in the way that uh, that they use monitoring agents and log monitoring to satisfy this control. It's kind of a uh, low effort, low cost, um, low R&D kind of a thing. Um, well, to some degree, I shouldn't say low R&D because there, there's a lot of overhead that comes with writing your own uh, tooling, but it can be simple. And we've seen some pretty simple implementations using open source tools combined with uh, some homegrown scripts. But aside from a homegrown plus open source tool, there's obviously uh, quite a few third party tools that can uh, satisfy this. Uh, Beyond Trust is a company that's got one. Uh, their product is called Endpoint Privilege Management for Unix and Linux. That's a mouthful. Uh, but the idea behind that tool, for those that aren't aware already, um, 
is to have total visibility to who's doing what across all the nodes in your cloud environment. As you log in and hop around from host to host, um, your command history is known and it's aggregated to make auditing easier. Uh, so that's a really cool tool. Uh, I guess another point I'll make about Beyond Trust is uh, they, um, they have, uh, uh, they support the idea of um, integrating with corporate LDAP and they support two-factor authentication, which are again, other uh, good uh, check marks to check off uh, uh, on your security compliance checklist. Um, so that's elevated privilege management, um, really neat tools that can uh, deliver to that control. And then next slide, Nick, we'll talk about event auditing. Um, and for this use case, I'm gonna use uh, an OpenStack environment as the example for the tool. Uh, but event auditing is basically addressing the seven W's of audit and compliance, which you can read what those, what those are. Uh, again, if I look at the CCM control spec for DSI-1, it's a pretty short and sweet uh, control that just says uh, that you've got to have a classification for data and objects containing data. It's pretty simple. Um, now, the value that an organization has on data is going to uh, differ from uh, industry to industry and company to company, which is why it doesn't really prescribe anything more specific than this. Um, so again, if I use an OpenStack environment and I think of data and objects, uh, that context right there uh, might or should trigger uh, the thinking around uh, how do I know who is uh, creating OpenStack objects in my cloud? Uh, this could be the same for Kubernetes, could be same for um, for containers, right? How are things being orchestrated? Who's orchestrating that? Uh, where is it going? Those kinds of things. So the idea here is, is to have auditing for events and have a means of classifying the data. Um, so um, the classification of OpenStack data um, can point to a tool like CADF. Uh, CADF is the Cloud Audit Data Framework. It's an open framework that allows uh, for uh, complete visibility to how OpenStack objects are created. Um, so one thing to note here um, is that, uh, yeah, this particular control ID, DS, DSI-1, um, it just mentions the need to assign a classification. It doesn't say anything more is needed. It doesn't suggest that CADF is needed. Um, but again, because of the CADF tool, if you knew what the CADF tool was without looking at this control spec, um, you might be able to kind of take this solution and, and kind of find the problem. What's, you know, I, I can see value in the CADF tool. What problem, you know, uh, could I solve with this that's related to security? And I'm just proposing, advocating that uh, DSI-1 is a good match. So, so that's the fourth of the four tools that we wanted to, to cover using, again, this process of looking at keywords in generally vague, ambiguous control language and using those keywords to come up with uh, uh, a, a proposal of tools and processes that support them. And Nick, if you can go to uh, the next slide to summarize here, uh, we started off you know, this conversation with this idea that the CSA cloud control matrix helps humanize security language. You can download a copy of it. You can see what those categories are. Uh, you can see what the control uh, IDs are and what the language is. Compare that to NIST uh, or PCI um, and you'll, uh, you'll see what I mean. It's, it's, um, it's a lot easier to understand. Um, and once you understand that, uh, you know, interpret those controls to your use case. Uh, if you look at how um, financial services is going to look at a control uh, compared to, um, you know, pharmaceutical. There's going to be some similarities, but there's also going to be some differences. And uh, someone's preference for tool selection is going to, uh, you know, guide them towards maybe a different, uh, different tool that has a different level of complexity and cost. Uh, but to the bullet point, you know, the third bullet point here 
just implement tools that you can defend. You need peace of mind that you can sit in an audit in front of an auditor. Um, and when they ask you, how are you satisfying control X? You can just say, I'm using this tool. Here's my processes. Uh, the auditor will say, great, show me evidence that you last ran this certain tool or show me how you can find data using this tool. And as long as you can prove that, you're golden. Uh, just document that process and maintain evidence of that process performance. So um, those are the main points we wanted to cover. Um, uh, anticipate there's probably some questions that uh, uh, hopefully have um, uh, been generated as I've been covering uh, these exactly. points and principles. So if we can get to that. All right. So now is your chance. If you have not yet uh, dropped a question in the questions pane, uh, now is the time. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and see what we have in terms of questions. Um, you said you would run. Okay. So uh, I'll let uh, Brian and Jason, I'll let you guys decide who's going to answer which question. But uh, you said you would recommend running a baseline check more frequently than annually. How frequently would you recommend? Um, well, actually, Jason, I think that's probably a good one for you. Yeah, so for me, um, like I said, being a global CISO in my past and also auditor, uh, I recommend two things. One, I recommend it from a quarterly aspect. But then again, what I also recommend is that you look at it of how much change in management that you're doing and how much of that change in management and updating and concept you have is actually impacting the systems and can cause a vulnerability or a gap in your security aspect. So minimum for me has always been uh, once a quarter. But like I said, if I've got a project or a program that has come up and I feel that it's caused are going to cause me an issue, then I'll go ahead and actually run it sooner. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, what what is a good security framework to start with? Well, you know, my opinion is what I look at when it comes to a good security framework is a couple of things. What I look at is Understand, you know, the first thing that you should do is understand the business, right? Where your company, how they work, what the goal is, and things of that concept, okay? Because the more you understand your business, the more you can understand how to secure your business, right? So that's that's what I always look at because there's so many frameworks out there. That's where a basic start is. From that point, I would say, um, from that point, I would say, you know. CSA, uh, the Cloud Security Alliance, is a really good framework. I like it because it takes a lot of the great. It takes NIST and PCI and HIPAA, and it takes a lot of them, and it kind of puts them all together in one package for you. And it also kind of helps keep it very simplistic, right, because it helps break it down a little bit into layman terms when it comes to the IDs and stuff like that compared to if you just jump straight into – like NIST or PCI or something like that, right? So that that's I would say CSA, uh, Cloud Security Alliance, CCM is is a good place to start. Okay, excellent. Yeah, and one one thing I'll, I'll add as uh, as I've uh, uh, thought of the same question, um, what what you shouldn't assume about the CCM is that you don't if you do CCM you don't have to do NIST right there's not a it's not a I'm doing CCM and uh, I, I'm off the hook for these other frameworks um, the CCM is kind of like and I just kind of thought of this a minute ago it's kind of like an API abstraction of these other frameworks right um, if you can deliver to the language in CCM just know again like I've said before that delivering to that to that CCM spec has uh, mappings to these other controls. So by, by delivering on CCM, you're inherently delivering NIST. So if your requirement from your security organization and your company is NIST, there's nothing wrong with using CCM as kind of that abstraction. And then just knowing what, what controls in NIST that those that abstraction uh, satisfies. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, so uh, we have 
uh, a, a member of the audience would like to know, where can we get the list of standard compliance controls to measure against, like the CCM control spec IVS01? Brian? Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, it's, yeah. It's, there's a website for that. Uh, we can send that, um, in fact, here, let me see if we can just provide that. Um, yeah, just real quick while Brian's pulling that up. So when it comes to the compliance concept uh, for CCM, um, NIST, or any of them, you know, th they offer a lot of great template packages, the actual, you know, uh, organizations themselves. I mean, we can obviously provide links and help you, but like I said, CCA, has a great uh, template package for comparison charts that, that their chart shows the CCA and then it shows how that control ma maps back to NIST and COBIT and, and HIP and the different concepts, right? So they have a good chart and, and things like that. Uh, and PCI and M do that also, just you know, for a high level answer. Um, but like I said, Brian can also, you know, we can also help provide some links for that to make it easy for you. Excellent. Yeah, if you go to, if you go to cloudsecurityalliance.org, uh, from there, you can uh, download uh, the. In fact, I, I'm at their website right now, and uh, yeah, you'll see the cloud controls matrix uh, listed there, referenced there that you can download. Excellent. Okay, uh, Jason, my company has an audit coming up. Any advice on how to prepare and what to expect? Yeah. So the big thing to do to prepare for an audit. You know, a lot of times is try to have an you know try to have an internal meeting with the teams that you have your network team, your infrastructure, different ones, and you kind of go over you know your internal compliance level, right? Because you should have done an internal gap and different things for your own you know compliance, right? Of where you stand. So what I always tell my teams is to have a meeting. Let's all review the internal gaps and where we stand. Let's make sure that we're aligning it with any risk and anything that's coming up with GRC. So that way, when the auditor comes up, we would uh, we'd have a great you know answer or feedback for them. So if there is something we meet, great. Here's here's how we meet it. Here's the policy. Here's how we handle that. If we do not meet it, we can address it, right? Like I said, we don't ever want to give too much information, but if it is asked, we ad we can address it that way. And if we have a good communication within our teams, we're all in the same. Uh, concept when it comes to that kind of conversation with an auditor because they will go to different team members and you kind of want to make sure you're on the same page okay and, and you just said something that um is seems to be very good advice which is basically don't give too much information if they don't ask you don't tell them yeah don't, don't, yeah. don't send your chatty as the team member <laughs> yeah it's it's definitely you know you want to I hate to put it exactly like that, but it's it's when I when I've been a you know QSA and auditor myself, you definitely want to treat it somewhat like a polygraph, which is yes or no answers, and then if it's it, you know and then let them ask you the questions. Never divulge too much. Let them ask you the question. A good thing to do that I've done is when I ask you quite repeat it to make sure you understand exactly what their question is, so you can provide exactly that information, and then that way you're just not opening up too much of a box for yourself. Right. And, and, you know, we're not, we're not telling anyone to, you know, deceive the auditor in any way or to hide anything, but, you know, it can get confusing if you start, you know, like you say, opening up boxes that don't need. Yeah. To I mean, you're definitely, you're not trying to hide. There's no, I mean, there's no reason to hide anything from an auditor. I mean, and most auditors, like I said, even if you don't have, like, let's say there's a compliance that you need to meet, but you don't meet it. A lot, a lot of times, I mean, they will sit down with you and they will just discuss it. Like, why can't you meet it? Is it a process? Is it a po is it is something in your product or what? You know, why why can't you? And they'll make a note of it because it's not a the audit. Sometimes is a pass or fail concept, but there's a, there's a there's a calculation behind it to you know to address everything. So you can still pass even with a bunch of no's if there's a whole at, at the whole picture, right? Right. So you you want to you want to look at the whole picture of an audit, not just the yes or no single, and try to stay hidden in a in a little room. <laughs> but would would auditors ever kind of help you by telling you you know okay look yeah you you didn't meet this that the other thing this is what you need to do. Well, it depends on the auditor, 
but yes, I mean, I've had auditors that's come back and said, Hey, you didn't meet this, you know, you didn't meet this. Um, and maybe this is you know, a way to address it, or you might want to look at this industry standard, a best standard or something. A lot of times it depends on who's doing your audit. Like if you're, you know, if it's obviously if it's your internal audit, they'll probably help you more. If it's one of the big four audit companies, um, they might also help you because what some audit companies do is they also audit you, but then they also give you a checklist of how their companies can help you fix those deficiencies, right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, you know, it depends on, on the type of company that's doing your audit and what the audit's for. But yeah, I've definitely had companies go back with a checklist going, hey, by the way, here's how we can help you fix those. Right, right. Okay. What what are some common stumbling blocks? Mm, for an audit? For well, I mean for an audit or for compliance or you know. Well either. the biggest the biggest stumbling blocks is honestly is like what you know Brian addressed in the in the in the uh in the presentation just now is that the stumbling blocks a lot is interpretation, right? You gotta understand when you when you read through these policies you know, they're very vague, the way they're wrote, the way they're, you know, and some of them are even high level and very detailed, and you're really more confused. So the stumbling block a lot of time is just taking, you know, taking a step back and then just trying to decipher the policy, right, you know, um, or the compliance itself, because, you know, there's obviously an answer for it somewhere, you know, whether it's working with somebody, Google, you know, there's there's an answer for it. But that's what I found is a lot of stumbling blocks is, you know, I'll hand a new compliance to, you know, a team, and they look at me like I just hit them, you know, in the face or something, and I'm like, well, <laughs> you know, I'm like, you, you need to, you just need to read through it, and then we can talk about it, you know, let's understand what they're asking, let's try to break down the secret code of if it's a policy or if it's a product, you know, idea, and things like that, so that's always been my biggest stumbling block, is just, like, like I said, what Brian just really covered was the implement, you know, how do you interpret what they're saying? Got it. Yeah, you know, um, one thing I would add to that is um, uh, sometimes, there, I, I mean, I've seen this case where uh, an organization is asked for evidence of compliance to a certain control, and the response is, here, here's, here's the tool that I use. And, uh, and they go, great, um, show me the logs, show me you know, when it was last run, and then you get the deer in the headlights look. If you're going to have a tool, that's why we <laughs> mentioned this at the beginning of the presentation, if you're going to have the tool, you've got to show evidence of performance. You can't, you know, uh, get caught. Um, it, it's not a victory just to say, I have a tool. You've got to have yeah. the performance of it. Yeah, I'll add a little bit even more to that for Brian, is that is part of an audit. Sometimes, like, you know, when you go in and they, they might do a checkbox going, do you have a seam solution? Well, yes, we do. Okay, how can you check the logs? Let me see a, Let me see an example of the logs. Let me see your process, right? Same as incident response. You have an incident. Okay, well, do you have a policy? I, we do. Well, can we, you know, let's, let's talk about it just briefly about how do you, how, you know, what is your process? What's your, how do you handle it? Like, oh, oh, okay, you know. <laughs> so there is pieces of that nature too that come into play. When it comes to an audit, that like so they might not drill down deep, but the uh, the idea of an audit is that if you've got something in place like file integrity management, seam, you know, vulnerability scanning, whatever, that you're also using it and you're looking at it, right? That's not you can't just have it and then send the logs to a data center and then you know don't do anything with them, right? That's that's kind of a no go. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, uh, I I would encourage if anybody has any more questions to go ahead and um, drop them in. If you were trying to download the slides um, and you got, uh, and, and it wasn't working, uh, that is corrected now on the, uh, on the slide. So you can see the correct URL. That's on uh, you, thank you. Um, but uh, yeah, so if, if you've got, I mean, do you guys have any other comments that you want to make while we wait for any last minute questions? And you've um, given us a lot of information and a lot of things to think about at this point. Yeah, so. I mean, the only thing I can say honestly is, a, is another feedback is, you know, don't be scared, take your time and just work and communicate and address it, you know, uh, with your internal team. Like I said, I can't, I cannot, uh, 
reiterate enough is communication with your own company. Like I said, being a global CISO and being on boards and committees and understanding how your company works to apply the correct policies is so important. And because like I said, you can, you can decide to implement a policy that could break the company. And obviously that's not good for your career. Right. Right. So you want to definitely understand that piece. And that's where I see a lot of weaknesses. I'm a guest speaker in conferences is that people just don't talk to the company or understanding what their company does. I mean, you know, they might have an idea, but what's the goal of the company to achieve? Because they, like I said, and, and, and what's their roadmap? Even with finance, for example, let's say finance is looking at implementing like, you know, a new eight, like SAP or Oracle or something. Well, that's going to impact you on your, with your, you know, from a cyber aspect and security and everything. So you want to make sure you're in those communications and you want to be ahead of the game, right? So if you can get the sooner security can get in any meeting of a rollout, the better off you'll be because you don't want to be the person who gets the email going tomorrow, we're going to roll out Oracle and you wasn't in any part of the design or infrastructure of that. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. So, uh, Brian, which security framework applies to telco clouds? No. Yeah, good question. Um, well, there's a... Uh, mm. It, it depends, and this I'll touch on some of the, some of what Jason just mentioned, and I'm sure Jason can add more more color as well. Uh, you got to look at your business. Um, you got to look at uh, what what data are you holding. Depending on uh, what data you're holding, depending on what customer you're serving, um, that's going to dictate uh, what uh, framework or frameworks you need to apply to. You know, you need to align with. Um, it could be NIST. Uh, you might need, depending on the region of the world, you might need to align with GDPR. Um, if you're a Chinese telco, you um, uh, might have some uh, Chinese-specific security laws to align with. Um, there, it, it varies. So that's why, again, you need to kind of follow what Jason was suggesting. You got to look at your business and understand uh, where 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 are the where are the attack points, and is there a framework uh, whose you know, controls address those attack vectors. Yeah, so just to add to that to Brian, I mean, he's 100%, you know, on, and it does, like I said, it, it definitely divides up, because whether it's telco or whoever, I mean, you can, you can be a telco company, but the system that you're trying to secure could be HR internal related versus a customer outbound system. So yeah, you definitely just want to understand, again, your environment, and what that solution is doing to meet that proper compliance. One other thing, uh, are you regulated? Um, if you're regulated, there might be a requirement based on the regulatory body over you that dictates uh, what security framework you've got to follow. So there's a lot of different factors. Right. Excellent. Well, um, we are we are almost out of time and we are out of questions unless anybody wants to throw one throw one in going once going twice sold we will give you back four minutes of your day i want to thank everyone who attended this webinar and i especially want to thank our panelists today jason james and brian langston and as always, our super producer, Michelle Yakura, thank you. We could not do this without you. Uh, I am Nick Chase, and I want to thank everyone. And uh, you will have the recording. Oh, wait a minute. No, no, no. Wait. Last, last question. Last question. I almost got, almost got away with it. So there's no single framework that applies to telcos. It varies with geographies. Correct? There is not. Okay. Well, there you there's go. There's not because, like I said, every... Every telco that I've worked with, which is pretty much globally, it all depends on what that solution is doing. Some uh, have their own internal compliance that they designed as a company, like a lot of companies do, but there's not one associated with just telco. All right. Yeah. There we our, go. Our, yeah, our customer base, we've got, yeah, it, telcos in about every geo, and there is not a consistent one that we, uh, not a consistent framework that we apply. Yeah. All right. Excellent. And that will take us out. Thank you all so much for joining us and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot.